to the vaccines themselves, uh, on their release, they were declared to be safe and effective by the FDA in America, and by the TGA in Australia. Uh, there are now those starting to say we're not quite so sure about the long-term impacts. Uh, do you have a view uh, on uh, how, how, how good the vaccines are and whether they were carefully evaluated? Sure. So uh, the, the, the evaluation of the vaccines relied on a gold standard kind of, kind of approach, which is uh, a randomized controlled trial. In a randomized trial, uh, there are uh, you know, tens of thousands of people were assigned either randomly to the vaccine arm or to a control, control group. Uh, these trials occurred in 2020, uh, run by companies like Pfizer and Moderna uh, and, and, and AstraZeneca. Uh, now, these, these trials uh, lasted about three months and you had tens of thousands of patients. The vaccines then are rolled out essentially to billions. You know, a, a billion or more people have taken, you know, actually it's like something like two billion people have taken the vaccines. Um, when you have a trial that run, um, in tens of thousands and then you roll it out to, to billions, you're going to have unexpected things happen. Things you didn't see or ha in the trial uh, will happen in the real world. So let's talk about, you asked safe and effective. Let's, let's talk first about effectiveness. In the trials, the trials showed that that the, the, the vaccines prevented symptomatic infection. That is, you, you had COVID and you had symptoms from COVID and it prevented them at 95% efficacy for three months. Now, the trials didn't ask and didn't check whether it stopped you from getting infected with COVID at all. Maybe you had a very mild infection. Um, you did, didn't check for that. Uh, it also didn't check to see if you died from COVID or other, other, other things. It didn't have enough people in the trials. Tens of thousands turns out to be not enough to check to see if there's an effect on severe disease and death in the trials. But the, the trial results were effective enough to say, yes, we should use it in the population. And I think that was absolutely the right decision. Um, but what we learned in the, inter, uh, in the process after the, trial, the, the vaccines were released is that in fact, the vaccines are not very effective at stopping you from getting COVID. It's not very effective at stopping the transmission of COVID. So I was vaccinated in April of 2021, and three months later, I had COVID. August of 2021, I guess four months later. Um, uh, that's actually a very typical pattern. Many, many people, I, I mean, I think, I, I, you know, a very large fraction of people who have been vaccinated have had COVID in, in, you know, subsequent to the vaccination because the vaccine does not stop you from getting or COVID or transmitting COVID. On the other hand, uh, experience with the vaccine afterwards suggests that for older people especially, you it actually does protect against getting severe disease if you get COVID, right? So it reduces the risk of hospitalizations, reduces the risk of death if you get COVID. So it might take somebody who's 80 years old for whom the infection fatality rate of COVID was 6% and might reduce that to 0.5%. It's a pretty substantial improvement in the likelihood of surviving if you get COVID. Um, and so the vaccine then uh, should be used, I believe, for focused protection of vulnerable people, people for whom the, 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 the getting the vaccine reduces the harm from COVID by quite a bit. Um, it can't be used to stop disease spread. It, 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 in other words, it has a private benefit. It protects me if I get COVID, for, for, if I get COVID I'll be less likely to die from getting it. Uh, but it doesn't have a very large public benefit. Uh, if, if, I, if I'm vaccinated, I don't protect you very much, John, uh, because I can still get COVID, I can still pass it to you. It's very different than many other yeah. vaccines. Uh, on the question of safe, uh, we've learned that it's, it's uh, that, that roughly speaking, uh, there are populations of people for whom the vaccine produces some side effects that we didn't expect. So for instance, young men have va vaccine-induced myocarditis, that is inflammation of the heart, at, at high rates actually, one in 1,000, one in, one in 1,000, one in 2,000, one in 3,000, uh, estimates vary, uh, after the vaccine. These are young men f for whom the vaccine doesn't really reduce the risk of dying from COVID very much because they didn't have a very large risk of dying in the first place from COVID. And so the way I look at it, um, you, you make the vaccine available to everyone you can. Prioritize older people from getting it because those are the people who are at highest risk of dying from COVID. Uh, recommend strongly that they take it because even though there are some uncertainty about 
uh, what might happen after you take the vaccine. There may be side effects we don't know about, for instance. Um, the benefit is very, very high. Uh, for populations for whom the benefit is low, it doesn't, doesn't make, it, I would say, be much more careful about it. You can go talk to your doctor and see, based on your uh, particular clinical circumstances, whether it makes sense for you. It's a private medical decision that should be made by people on the basis of good medical advice. It shouldn't be something that is induced and coerced where the population at large is forced to take it. Because it doesn't really matter if 95% or 20% of the population is vaccinated as far as the risk to me. All that matters to me is if I'm vaccinated, I can, I can, I, and based on my age, I'll have my own risk factor. It doesn't matter if, if I'm in a room full of unvaccinated people, they don't pose any additional risk to me than being in a room full of vaccinated people. Um, and so uh, I, I think that's the, that's the key thing, the, the two key takeaways. One is use the vaccine to protect older people particularly, but a, allow people uh, to, to go treat the vaccine like, like a, uh, a, a private medical decision where they get good medical advice. And then don't use the vaccine, don't coerce people to take the vaccine in the foolish bid to try to make the, vac the, the disease go away. The vaccine just isn't fit for that. So I would agree with much of that. Um, I have a, a father who's 91 years old and he's quadruple jabbed and he's in New York State. And as I've said from the beginning, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, male and over 90, you know, that's, that's pretty much the, you know, the worst group, although he doesn't have too many comorbidities, thank goodness. Um, but, uh, but I do think that the, the, the excessive focus on should we or should we not do the vaccine and for whom is it good and everything, again, sweeps under the carpet the fact that there are many other things one can do to reduce the severity of COVID. <laughs> Keeping yourself healthy, generally, uh, eating well, sleeping well, you know, making sure you're not deficient in vitamins and, you know, generally doing everything we do to improve our immunity um, against any kind of bug, which, by the way, we were pressing against with lockdowns, um, is, is actually the first thing you should be doing, right? That's the first thing you should think about. And, and then, of course, the second thing is anybody should be making a decision about whether to get the vaccine or whether to take, you know, a, a vitamin C tablets or any other decision about his or her health on the basis of what's good for him or her, not on the basis of the social good. Because once we start going down that, that very dangerous, slippery slope of saying, here is a medical intervention that I'm going to give to you because it is good for everybody else. I don't really know whether it's good for you, and, and maybe it's not good for you, but you know what? It's good for everybody else, so here you go. Right? That is very dangerous. We know what that looks like. And I, I, do, I won't mention the historical analog because everybody will be thinking about it, but that, that is very dangerous. And so in the situations that, that Jay was describing, the young men, certainly also the pregnant women, the lactating women, we don't have data on such people and, and in terms of their reaction to the vaccine because they weren't included in, in most of the initial trials. And, and so we really don't know whether the vaccine is safe. And usually for most kinds of new medicines, pregnant women are considered kind of the most vulnerable group in society. They carry the next generation and, and they're very vulnerable in that sense. And so yes, we want to protect them, but not through putting things into their arms that are, that are unproven in the long term because they hold someone in them who is going to be with us for the long term, right? They're the youngest uh, of, of, you know, the species. And so same thing with children and toddlers. So I've been particularly distressed at the, the ferocity with which these vaccines have been marketed to people who didn't have much of a risk from, from COVID to begin with, and all with this overlay of, well, it's good for society, right? That to me is very dangerous. And it goes to this point of coercion. If you use social structures to coerce people into taking medical decisions, that is a violation of fundamental human medical autonomy. It is a violation, I believe, of the Nuremberg Code because of the fact that these vaccines are still only provisionally approved. Uh, it's an experimental drug. It's an experiment. It's a medical experiment. Uh, and so that's, I think, another thing that's going to come out in the wash after another two or three or four years. I do expect to, despite the fact that I agree that the vaccines can be useful for some people in the population in consultation with their doctors, I still expect that Pfizer leadership will probably end up in jail. I think there will probably be some jail time, certainly some very, very, very steep fines, as they have paid in the past. Um, and as big companies, pharmaceutical companies uh, of other uh, brands have paid in the, t in the past after having made big mistakes. And we know that it takes a couple years for this to happen. I recall to you the, the thalidomide disaster. 
uh, back in the 1950s. And that took a few years until it became clear, based on individual reports from gynecologists and obstetricians who were finding, oh my goodness, why are we getting so many deformities? Oh gosh, I think it could be that I've assigned, I've, I've prescribed this pregnant woman thalidomide for her anxiety. And in fact, it was causing uh, you know, problems. And of course, we know now, even more so than at that period, there are many disincentives to reporting side effects with these vaccines. It's very uncool to do that because it's very much not aligned with the interests of big money and, and big power. And so and I'm not being a conspiracy theorist, but just as a scientist, I look at that as somebody who studied power for you know 10 or 15 years and, and the impact of networks and social influence. Uh, it, is, it is not an environment right now in which people can feel free to say, oh, I'm, I'm worried about the side effects or I had a side effect or please report my side effect. It, it's just not very easy to do that. It's like being in science and trying to you know, state an, a counter opinion to, to the standard narrative.